everybody. Welcome to how to contribute to a big, complex open source project. So uh, in this session, we're going to go over a little bit about uh, open search, uh, which is where I work. Um, and then we'll go into a lot of general things about big, uh, complex projects. And open search, uh, open search is one of those. Uh, I have a guest with me today, and we're going to be talking about that. But before we begin, let's go over our agenda. Um, We'll be going over just kind of some nuts and bolts and um, as well as int introduction to the whole project and the context we're working in. And then we'll talk about how we're applying that in this particular project. So um, my name is Kyle. Um, I'm the senior developer advocate um, for open search at AWS. So uh, I, I, this is the way I look. I, I don't think we have um, uh, video playback on this particular uh, session uh, because we are recording it in an unusual way. Um, so, um, but I do want to show you what I look like and then go over a little bit about myself. Uh, I usually do this biography and numbers thing, and this is just a few numbers that um, help me kind of tell my story. Um, the first one is 92. 1992 is the year I started uh, writing software seriously. Um, in that time, I was such a weird kid. Um, I was I was really into writing um, Ada, um, and I wrote a compiler uh, when I was when I was very young. I should have been out riding my bike, uh, but instead, I was really interested in um, all things about uh, writing software that compiles other software. Um, and it got all the books out of the library. And so ever since then, that's been the bug bit me. It's been a huge part of my life for the majority of my life. Um, so that's 92. 241 is, or 242, depending on the day this, you're seeing this in a conference, is the number of days I've been working at Amazon. So I'm a relatively um, newcomer. Um, and uh, it's it's been a really interesting time uh, with this particular project. I was actually hired for a different project, um, but um, hired for a related but different project. Um, so I've been here since the beginning of Open Search, and it's been a just, just a roller coaster, but a blast. Three, three is the number of search engines I've worked with in my career. Um, these search engines have varied from kind of small libraries uh, through uh, kind of upstart search engines to now open search. And so uh, search is a domain that I find to be really interesting. Um, and I, I think it's a, a fascinating way to um, look at the world and, and look at data. Um, 53. Uh, 53 is the parallel of which I live. So I live in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, um, and that is the northernmost city in Canada. And uh, as you might imagine, that is as cold as it sounds uh, in the winter, but it's a beautiful place in the summer. So uh, this time of year is great. Uh, I encourage people to visit. Just don't come in, in January. It's not a very pleasant place to be. Uh, eight. Eight is the number of pounds my dog weighs. And it's possible, given that I'm recording this at home, that you will hear a dog barking in the background. I apologize. Uh, if you do end up following me on social media, I talk about basically three things, uh, search engines, 3D printing, and my dog. So um, if you do see him, that's that's he's a tiny little guy, and he may jump in my lap uh, while I'm presenting. But uh, since we don't have video playback, you won't get to see him. Now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Spot. He's going to tell, tell, uh, tell me a little and you about his stuff. Thanks, Kyle. Hi, uh, my name is Tom Calloway, but I'm much better known as Spot. I am a principal open source evangelist on the AWS open source strategy and marketing team. I am very jealous of Kyle's uh, numbers intro because I think that's very clever and I'm gonna have to steal it for another presentation. Uh, I uh, My background is I worked at Red Hat for 19 years before coming over to AWS, doing a little bit of everything for them. I am uh, I like to hack on things, uh, take things apart, put things back together. I've been doing that for as long as I can remember, much to my parents' chagrin. Uh, I have three 3D printers, uh, two children, two boys, uh, and one pinball machine. Uh, so that sort of gives you a scope of the wider array of things that I'm interested in. Uh, but we're not really here to talk about me. We're here to talk about uh, uh, how to contribute to a complicated open source project in the framework of open search. Kyle? Yeah, so let's talk a little about that. Um, so what is open search? You may have heard of it. You may have not heard of it. Um, open search is a new project. It's a community driven open source search and analytics suite. Uh, it's derived from the Apache 2 licensed Elasticsearch uh, 7.10.2 and the Kibana 7.10.2. Uh, I, I don't usually read verbatim from the screen, but this is something that we're repeating just because it's it's really um, relevant and we're, we're kind of Making this wide so everybody knows what we are. Um, it consists of three. Uh, it consists of a search engine, a daemon, which is called Open Search, a visualization and user interface uh, called Open Search dashboards, as well as a series of functionality and tools and plugins. Now, um, this the history of this project is a little bit interesting. Basically, uh, you know. You can tell from the derived from part in the first paragraph or first sentence that um, it is a fork of Elasticsearch and Kibana. Um, and the functionality adding tools and plugins actually come from a project called the Open Distro for Elasticsearch project, which was um, the kind of predecessor of OpenSearch, um, which is a series of really cool um, uh, tools and plugins that uh, round up functionality that was in the, those Apache 2.0 licensed versions. So you take those two things and you put them together. Uh, so the forks of Elasticsearch and Kibana and uh, all these tools and plugins, and you have a, a a full suite of um, uh, analytics and search uh, that's available completely open source licensed. Um, so as you can imagine, these are huge projects. Um, and 
because of that, um, you know, we were kind of, um, you know, this is something that we, we uh, forked these because there was a license change in Elasticsearch and Kibana, so it was kind of sudden um, that, that this was something that we were going to do. So that happened earlier in the year. Um, if, we, you know, December of last year told us that we would be in this situation, um, we wouldn't have done it, but we're so glad that we are. Um, so one of the things that we really wanted to do uh, when this kind of project had its inception was that we wanted to set up some principles. Uh, these are principles of open, of open source development that we're using to move this project forward. Um, one of the most important things is we have this kind of preamble, uh, and, and that's the line in blue here. When we, the contributors, are successful, open search will, will be. So these, this is a forward-looking statement and saying this is where we want to be, um, and this is kind of how we're also defining our success. So there's eight principles. I'm going to go over them and talk a little bit about them. Now, in the scope of uh, open source projects, a lot of times they have kind of similar ideas that are set forth that kind of uh, form the mission of, of these. And this is what um, is for our project, but it doesn't necessarily apply to every project. I don't think that they are uh, bad principles that, that could be, uh, they certainly could be applied generally. Um, so but this is what we're kind of focusing on for, for our project. So the first thing is great software. Uh, and great software solves problems. Um, and if it doesn't solve problems, then why are you using it? Uh, and it's got to be software that you love to use. Um, you know, we've all seen that software that, that has uh, solved some amazing problems, but man, it's unpleasant. Um, we don't want to build that software. That's not something that we see as being successful. Uh, the next principle is open source like we need it. Um, so open source is a long-term investment. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, we're committed to bringing this project forward over the long haul. Uh, additionally, uh, with open source, we don't want it to be kind of watered down open source. We use a well understood license, Apache 2.0, um, and we don't have anything that would kind of limit um, what people are um, really uh, doing with the project. And we try to make sure that if it works for Apache 2, it's fine. Uh, we also don't have uh, you know, things that make it hard to contribute. So things like contributor license agreements. So we want to make it super easy. So that's the first two principles. Let's move on and look at some of the other ones. Uh, the next one is a level playing field. Um, so that's basically saying we want this project to be for everybody. Um, and it shouldn't be preference to one uh, way of running it. It shouldn't be preference to one vendor. Um, and it certainly shouldn't be uh, advantaging one person at the expense of another. Um, and that being said, uh, you know, we're certainly open if something happens inadvertently to correcting that uh, as it comes along. The next principle is being used everywhere. Uh, the goal um, for uh, this project is to be as widely used as possible. Um, so we want people to use it in their business and their software and in all their projects. Um, use it however you want and, and surprise us in, in how you're using it. So we're not saying it's for one specific thing. Uh, maybe with your input. Uh, Basically, uh, you know, we're going to make sure that people um, have a way of letting the team that's working on it, both inside and outside of Amazon, have a way to um, tell us about their requirements and the implementation of the features that they want in the software. Um, we believe that, um, you know, open source software, when you mean it, uh, is open to contributions. Um, so better software is built with more minds working on it, with a diverse, uh, a diverse uh, community of collaborators and contributors on it. Um, if you want to get involved, it doesn't matter what size of contribution you want to make, big, small, or huge, um, we want to make that happen. Um, so um, we're looking forward to making sure that um, as the project evolves, um, so will um, how people contribute to that project. Now, the last two, uh, let's talk about uh, respectful and approachable and friendly. Um, we believe that a project that is all three of those kind of properties uh, make sure that people are heard, valued, and accepted, um, and make sure that people who are varying levels of of skill and experience are welcome. Um, so this is not, you know, a, a project just for those who have, um, you know, uh, contributed to a million projects before. This is for people who uh, we hope that will have their first contribution to open source through the open search project. And the last one is a place to invent. Um, now, um, open search itself, and we'll talk maybe a little bit about this later, is um, a, a, a platform that can have um, extensions put into it. So. Um, when we say that, we want to make sure that people can rapidly innovate and, and put their own code into it and not have to worry about it being specific and where it fits into the overall um, project. But if you have some crazy idea that you want to make, it's modular enough that you can put that into it and get going on it. So it, it's a, a really a place where lots of different things can happen. So that's our eight uh, principles of uh, development. And we think that they're, they're a really good platform for us to kind of begin um, and, and go forward. So um, I'm going to throw this back over to Spot, and he's going to talk a little bit about um, open source in a general sense, since I've talked a little bit about open search specifically. Thanks, Kyle. So uh, obviously, open search is an open source project. And some of the big factors of what make it open source 
Uh, to start with, you have to have a license that is an open source license. Open search is available under the Apache license version two, which is a recognized and uh, definitely open source license. There's no ambiguity there. Uh, this is uh, partially because, uh, as Kyle mentioned, open search is a fork. Uh, and uh, so we inherited the license uh, from uh, the code base before, but we're also committed to keeping that license. Uh, open source is intentionally built to be community driven uh, because going beyond the license for a community to really be open source, it has to be something where lots of people are contributing uh, to that to make it better. Uh, you can certainly have something that is open source and license only, but you won't get the sort of acceleration that you get out of having a project where lots of people are actively contributing to it to help solve the problems that are unique to them or to help come together to solve the big challenges, complicated problems that come out of any sort of code base of this size and scope. And another key factor around open search is that it's not open core. Uh, open core is when you have a piece of open source software, usually at the center of an ecosystem, and then you have a broad spectrum of add-ons and features and modules and tools that aren't open source. Uh, and in those sorts of situations, uh, most of the value really isn't found in that core. It's found in all the add-ons that make it more usable, more friendly, more featureful, and that tends to really make it difficult for people to get excited about the open source core. And that's not something that we're ever planning on doing around open search. You're never going to see us have <laughs> this small core that is the only thing that is open source that we care about and lots of things in our ecosystem that are proprietary. So I mentioned the license uh, and I wanted to go into a little more detail about that. Um, a license is the text that describes the permissions and the restrictions that the copyright holder or the creator grants to other people. Now, an open source license is very specific in that it describes how everyone that is not the copyright holder gets the permissions to use, to modify, and distribute software under that license. Now, not all software licenses are open source, obviously. There's lots of proprietary software out there. There's lots of software where people have written their own license, and it can be really confusing, especially if you're not a lawyer, to understand uh, is this license a good license? Is this license a bad license? So ultimately, we have the benefit in the open source community of having the OSI, and the OSI determines whether a license is open source or not. Now, the OSI, or the Open Source Initiative, uh, they are a nonprofit that was formed uh, to educate uh, and advocate for the benefits of open source. They keep what's called the open source definition, which we're not going to go through in a ton of detail here, but basically it is a set of descriptive rules that describe an open source license. And so for a license to be open source, it has to meet all of the criteria of the open source definition and then be reviewed by the open source initiative, which, you know, in traditional open source fashion, includes a wide community of experts and uh, people with a lot of experience in open source to help them do a public review of the license. And then they do an internal review and licenses that they determine to be in compliance with the open source definition get marked on their website and listed as officially open source. So for example, the Apache 2 license, which is what OpenSearch uses, is a recognized open source license. Now, Kyle mentioned uh, CLAs earlier and I want to go into a little more detail about what that is. Uh, this is sort of especially important for uh, open search because we are a fork uh, and we had to fork because the upstream changed their license. And we don't want to have any concerns around copyright in open search, and we're being very, very cautious around that. And one of the ways that we're approaching that is by building a chain of trust. And the way that we've chosen to build the chain of trust in open search is by using a developer certificate of origin or a DCO. Now, a DCO is legalese, <laughs> which can make it difficult for some people to understand. But basically what it does is it allows us to have a lightweight mechanism to ensure that all of the incoming contributions to open search are correctly attributed and licensed, that we know where they're coming from, and that we know that they have the right license on the work. We don't want someone putting in an incompatible license or a proprietary license, and we certainly don't want people taking code from other uh, proprietary sources and including them in open search. We wanna make sure that we can say conclusively, this is where this code came from, and this is the license that it is available under. Now, another way to accomplish this is with a contributor license agreement or a CLA. And this is not something that we opted to use in open search. Now, a CLA tends to give broad permissions to the upstream owner of a project, including permissions to relicense the entire project. Now, CLAs are much longer and a lot more difficult to understand unless you have a lot of experience reading legal text or are a lawyer. And uh, there's a lot of CLAs that are used by big companies in ways that benefit them and not you at all. And we really wanted to be contributor friendly with open search. Uh, so we did not opt to go with a CLA. Now, I want to be clear, there are lots of open source projects that use CLAs in non-evil ways. 
Uh, but because there are projects uh, out there that do, and there is some concern about it, we opted not to just, we said, we're just going to go with the DCO instead of a CLA and not have anyone have to worry that we're trying to play corporate games. <laughs> so when you look at an open source project, there are lots of roles. Some of them are, are defined and some of them are ambiguous. Uh, and it can be really difficult when you're looking at a project sometimes to understand what exactly you can do. Uh, you know, it can be very intimidating, especially with a big complicated project to look at the GitHub and say, wow, where do I start? Uh, and the most obvious place to start in any sort of open source project like this is to be a user, is just to check out the code, run it, you know, solve the problem for you that it helps solve. And certainly you can, at any point in any open source project, become a user, hopefully, if the code works. Uh, and the next step beyond being a user is to be a contributor. Now, obviously, not every user is going to become a contributor, but it is our hope that in open search, we can make it as easy as possible for users who discover a bug, who uh, want to add a change or want to redo the way that something works, or they want to add a feature or they want to add a plugin, that they can really easily do so. Now, contributors don't have to just be code either. And that's a real big point that I want to make here is that a lot of people think contributor equals coder. And certainly in an open source project, lots of contributions do mean code, but they're certainly not limited to that. Uh, documentation is always, always, always appreciated, uh, helping us make sure that it's accurate, helping us make sure that it is complete, uh, helping us make sure that as we release new code, that documentation reflects that. Uh, just having people walk through the getting started guide and making sure that it works is something that every single open source project appreciates. Uh, they appreciate blogging. If you just talk about your experience with the project, good, bad, otherwise, that's a contribution. We're happy to have that. Um, User experience contributions are so appreciated because as Kyle mentioned before, open search wants to be something that you enjoy using, that it really solves the problem and you don't feel like, oh, this is so painful, why am I running this? Uh, and then once you've made substantial contributions to a project, usually the project will invite you to become a committer. And these are people who can directly make contributions to the code base without having to run it through a lot of other people first. And I'm being vague here because there's a lot of different ways that an open source project handles how it does commits. Some projects, the committers can just commit as they see fit. Some projects still require the committers to go through uh, multiple review steps from other committers before they can do it as a safety. Uh, some projects, the committer is just the only thing that's different between them and any other contributor is that they're one of the group of people that push the final bits into the code. Uh, you know, lots of projects do this differently. And I think, uh, Open source is, uh, is fun that way in that it does allow for a lot of variance in a governance model here. Uh, and then the PMC member, this is really, these are the people who are making the decisions about the direction of the project. They are the people at the top who have to make the hard choices about will we, will we do a thing? Will we change our license? Will we move to a new home? Will we move to a new name? All of the sort of hard choices that a project has to go through, usually an open source project doesn't have a lot of these in their lifetime, but it is important to have a clear understanding of who is making those decisions at the end of the day. Now, who writes open source software? Um, I think depending on who you are, you may have a very interesting perspective on this and a very diverse perspective on this, but it's really a spectrum. Like there's really a lot of range about who is participating to open source. I think when you see a very healthy open source project, you have a lot of contributors, but they're not necessarily contributing each a lot of code. Certainly you have some contributors that are full-time contributors. They are likely being paid either partially or full-time to work on this code base. They are deeply invested into it. They are working across the board. They're likely to understand the scope of the entire ecosystem very well. And so when they make an intrusive change, they understand the ramifications of what that means. So you're gonna, those are gonna be the people that when you look on the GitHub stats, you're gonna see that they have a lot of big contributions or at least a lot of broad contributions that go across the ecosystem. And then you've got your drive-by contributors. These are people who, they may be users, they may have come across a bug and they said, oh, well, I, I can fix that. And then they fixed that bug. And then they sent in that, that change, it was merged and they're done. That, that really was all they ever wanted to do was to fix that one bug that was bothering them. And sometimes these contributors, they over time become more full-time contributors. And sometimes they just, they just don't. They just fix that one bug and they were happy to help fix it and on they go. Sometimes they're just contributing a bug report. 
Sometimes they're just saying, hey, this broke for me. I wanted to get it fixed. I wanted to make sure you know it was broken. I might be the only person in the universe that's ever tried to do this with the software. Uh, and I think you want to make sure that you don't, in your project, assume that either is the only type of contributor that you're going to have. And I know that in open search, we have uh, definitely got some full-time contributors that are being paid by Amazon to work on this project. We anticipate that there will be lots of other uh, deep committers and contributors in the project, but we also are well aware that there are likely to be a lot of drive-by contributors just because of the nature of what we're trying to accomplish. And again, if we want it to be used everywhere, then that brings in a lot of people looking at the code and helping us make it better. Thanks, Scott. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about, you know, we, we said everybody who's doing this from drive-by to full-time committers, uh, or contributors, uh, let's talk a little bit about setting the direction of a project. I think there is a huge wide spectrum of uh, different types of direction setting in open source projects. Um, and, and I've kind of arranged these in, in different ways, and I'll talk a little bit about how um, open search works. But it, let's talk a little bit about um, open source, but not open to contribution. This is a, an interesting one. SQLite is a little bit like this. Um, if you read some of their things, I, I believe they even, uh, you know, are public domain, but they don't really allow people to contribute directly to it. Um, and, you know, that's still technically, uh, I think that would be considered open source. Um, then you get into things like benevolent dictators for life. Um, and, you know, I do want to, before I go forward, all these things are okay. Um, that's fine. Um, the benevolent dictatorships generally have one person or maybe one organization that sets the entire um, uh, roadmap for the um, project. And, you know, if, if there's contributions that please the dictator, they are accepted, right? Um, and, you know, for a long time, you, you see a lot of different projects that have been this way. For many years, Python had, uh, had a benevolent dictatorship. Um, I don't think it does anymore, but uh, there's also lots of them out there, and you, you probably can uh, use a dartboard to find them. Um, then you have ones that are basically an organization and community working together. So these tend to be um, ones that are open to contribution, um, and they're open to the or the community helping um, set the uh, roadmap and um, the whole gamut here. But there is an organization at the core of it, um, and you know you've seen lot. There's also another really common um, a common thing. And then you get into ones that are neutral in the community. So these basically uh, are very decentralized. There may be a decision-making uh, kind of body, but there's no like organization that is like the dominant force in that. Um, and um, so you, you'll see these a lot of times in, in you know, uh, foundation-donated uh, projects. Now, where does open search fall on this? It falls kind of into this organization and community at the moment um, category. Uh, we are very open to contributions, open to, con uh, to people telling us what is most important to them, and so we can build that software. But Amazon's still at the center of it at the moment. Now, um, does that mean the way it's going to be forever? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, that's something that, that hasn't been decided, and kind of the stance has been, um, you know, we're going to let and see how the community evolves here. And it may end up being that it does become a neutral, uh, you know, gov mutually governed um, uh, project, or it may end up being that it's not because, uh, you know, the, the community says that this is fine. Um, I don't anticipate it ever becoming a, uh, the first two categories. So um, we, we really do think this is, uh, we're very serious about how we're relating to the community and the contributions that we're accepting here. So, um, you know, it, we have kind of a long-term commitment to making sure that we're doing that. Now, um, when you get into um, how the project is organized, I think this this plays uh, a role in both uh, open search and as well in uh, other projects uh, because they, they kind of start, when you get to a certain size, they kind of start following some similar patterns. Um, on GitHub, the best place to get involved, of course, is the uh, uh, GitHub organization. Um, and, and that's kind of similar to how you as a person might have many uh, repositories that you're working with. Um, but um, in this case, uh, this is an organizational one. So Open Search Project is our um, organization. And then we have many repos underneath it. Um, so for example, Open Search is where the core uh, engine is developed. Um, and then we also have Open Search Dashboards, um, which is where the kind of UI and visualization is happening. Uh, but then there's, there's also 28 other uh, repos in this um, that are things like our plugins, and they're individually, um, uh, you know, version controlled, so they can um, operate somewhat independently. So you may have um, things like dependencies that are common among only uh, those projects maybe inside the organizational repo, uh, and you may also have things like non-code repos that talk about migration or how to contribute or documentation. Um, so there's a whole gamut of things that are available in a, a big open source project. So it can be a little intimidating to really get to know that. Um, so I think that's one thing to, to really start looking at is, um, you know, uh, I want to contribute to a project. Well, uh, dive into GitHub and start taking a look. 
But I think going more specific on that, finding a place to start um, is, is always challenging, especially as you approach these very large projects. Uh, the first place to look for is searching your issues and PRs on the project. Uh, odds are, if you've had a problem, if you have an issue, you may not be the first person to have that issue. So it's always good to, to search and get to know, um, you know, GitHub's um, particular um, search features where you can kind of say is closed, is open, uh, and find out that maybe your problem has already been solved. It's just not in a release yet or maybe your problem is one that is completely intractable and is put on hold, um, or it's waiting on something else, or a dependency, or and so on and so forth. So search your issues and find out if there is a, a, a issue that you would have to, to, um, to contribute to. Uh, if you're just looking for things to, to contribute to, uh, and you're saying, you know, I really, this, this project has helped me, so I want to help it, um, there's often tags that are there. Um, in open search, we use help wanted tags, um, and some other, like a, a Apache, Apache Software Foundation, I think they use low hanging fruit. Same, similar idea, these are, um, um, places where the project is looking for, they know they have problems and they are saying, these are a great place for you to go and solve. Um, so looking for those tags on GitHub, super good place to start. Now, um, finding the way that the project communicates, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but that's in a really important way. I, you know, it, I, I think of um, open source as as much of a communication method than as a uh, way of writing software. So um, always find a way that you can communicate with the folks in the project, and they'll have different norms. So find out the best way that they're doing that, and, it, and it's usually apparent by looking at the GitHub. Now, study the, the non-code uh, docs, so look at readmes, look at things like that. Now. Um, Let's talk a little bit about those. Um, contributing and developer guides are something that are super important. And it was one of my mistakes early on when I started contributing uh, um, to open source projects is I kind of, especially the contributing file, I never read it. And, and um, being a maintainer on a project, I started to realize that's a huge problem that a lot of people don't do. They really go deep into how you contribute and some of the mechanical bits on how it works. It'll go into environment and tooling. Um, and then code standards is a thing you may see in like developer guides. And these are really all these things that are just like absolute nuggets of gold that uh, if you avoid reading these kind of non-code uh, pieces of the repos, you're, you're going to be uh, at a disadvantage. Um, so the uh, other thing that we want to talk about, and mentioned it before, is just how you communicate. Uh, communicating in the project is going to take a lot of forms. Uh, so the, I have a few different ones I want to talk about. Um, so into maybe three categories. Uh, the first three points on this slide are kind of um, asynchronous ways of communicating. So in open search, for example, we have uh, active forums where uh, folks are discussing kind of long form things. Um, and this might be things that are involved in saying, you know, what do we want to do about this? I think we should do that. Something that would not be necessarily associated with a particular issue or PR. Very similar types of conversations would occur in maybe a mailing list uh, or a GitHub discussion. Um, and GitHub discussions is a particular, I believe it's beta feature of GitHub. So these kind of are all asynchronous. You're going to have a long time between responses and uh, questions, you know, uh, usually hours or days. Um, but then you get into the more uh, synchronous uh, forms of communication, things like community meetings, which is something we do in open search, and then things like uh, Slack and Discord, where you're, you have more of a chat environment. Um, so those are things that you'll see on a lot of open source projects. At the moment, we're doing community meetings in uh, open search right now. Um, so uh, the other ones are not off the table, which is not something we're doing right now. Um, and then the more mechanical and technical conversations usually can occur in issues are on PRs themselves. Uh, and different projects have different kind of lines where they might want to say, hey, take this to the forums or hey, take this to Slack. Um, rather than keeping the issues being, um, you know, really specific. And then other projects, the issues go off topic and uh, into just uh, even sometimes hilarious conversations. So um, it, you just have to look at the norms of all the projects. So uh, I want to start closing by saying, like, this is what we presented today uh, is talking about a few different things. Uh, Spots talked a lot about kind of some very broad ideas. I've talked about how open search is working uh, from a, um, a complex open source project is concerned, but this is only one way. This isn't the only way and we're not saying it's the best way. Um, so open search is new and we're still finding our way. Like that's most projects are in that. Now some projects that have been around forever have a very defined way of, of, of running, right? And that's fine, but Projects will be somewhere in this continuum. Now, the other thing to realize is that we're not really thinking about this as something where we're going to establish something and apply it on the community. Um, and I think a lot of open source projects are in this as well. They're going to grow and evolve, and they're going to change things as time goes on. So this is something where you have to kind of pay attention to know where the community is at um, and realize that things may be in a constant state of flux. Um, and that's especially true for open search. And also, uh, you know, for most people, 
everybody has a vested interest in the project, uh, wants to make sure that this is evolving into a project that people will really be interested in contributing to. So we're always trying to evolve it in a positive way. So I think that's all we've got today. Um, I want to make sure you keep in contact. Uh, my contact information is here if you want to talk about um, talk about uh, open search. I'm always welcome to do so. So thanks for your time. Thanks, everybody.